Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am literally so excited about this video. As you can see from the title, we're gonna be talking about how to become an influencer. So let me just, you know, Am I doing it right? So you may have clicked on this video thinking that that's actually what we are gonna be talking about, but if you know me, you know that there was bound to be a twist, and there is. So no, we're not gonna be talking about social media strategy. Yes, that word influencer, right? It has a certain meaning in our culture. It's typically somebody who works in social media or maybe does digital or content creation, but that's not all that word means. And I really wanna look at the root of that word, the root of the word influence and understand what it means because I think that when we understand what that word means, we can realize that every single one of us is an influencer. And even more than that, as Christ followers, we are called to be influencers. We are called to be the light of the world. We are called to be the salt of the world. And so no matter whether you have 1 million Instagram followers or you don't even have an Instagram account at all, you are an influencer. And not only are you an influencer, but as a follower of Christ, your influence is critically needed. And so I wanna dig into this idea of influence and look at the examples we have of that biblically. But before we do that if you are new to my channel please be sure to hit the subscribe button I do Bible study videos and all sorts of Christian lifestyle videos and I have a lot of fun stuff coming so make sure you don't miss out on that and then also if you do enjoy this video or find it encouraging which I hope you do please be sure to give this video a thumbs up because that is a huge way that you can help to support my channel so without further ado let's jump into this idea of influence if you see me looking down I have my computer propped up here with some notes but the first thing I want to look at is the definition of the word influence. So I just pulled this from the dictionary, googled it, and the definition of the word influence is this, the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. And so this idea of influence is so powerful, right? To think that we have influence, that we have the ability to influence somebody else and that through our actions or our words or the way that we live our life, we have the ability to affect change on somebody's behavior, on their development, on their character. That is huge and it is not something we should take lightly. And remember, you already have this. You are an influencer. Whether or not you realize it, you are having an effect on the people around you and you are influencing them toward something. And so again, as Christ followers, we are called to be influencers. We are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the world. And light obviously brings light into darkness, but salt, if you think about it, it is an agent of preservation. And so in the olden days, people used to put salt on their meat in order to preserve it. And as Christians, we are the salt of the world. So we are meant to be people who preserve God's truth, his way in this culture that does not know or honor him and so we are called as Christ followers to be influencers and as we talk about this concept of influence I want to look at the OG influencer Daniel in the Bible so if you were a Sunday school kid then you probably know Daniel as the guy who was thrown into the lion's den which he was that is sort of his little fun fact right that totally would have made it into his Instagram bio but there is so much more to the story of Daniel and I'm excited to dig into that this is not gonna be a comprehensive study on Daniel like I do in my Bible study series, but after going through this book again in preparation for this video, it kind of made me want to do a Bible study series on Daniel just because it's incredible. There is so much in here, so much to unpack. So who knows, maybe we'll do that, but there's also so many other books I wanna do a series on, so we'll see what comes next. If you missed it, we just finished going through the book of Ruth, so check that out if you haven't yet. But anyways, I wanna unpack Daniel's story a little bit for this video. So the first question to ask is who is Daniel? Daniel was an Israelite, so one of God's people who found himself living in the midst of Babylonian captivity. So the Babylonian king, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken the Israelites into captivity and specifically he had taken Daniel and three of his friends, Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego. They were these young Israelite men and he had taken them essentially into his inner circle and he wanted to train them up in the ways of Babylonian culture. And so Daniel was brought to this foreign country and he found himself 
fighting to retain his ethnic and his religious identity in this foreign culture that wanted to assimilate him into their ways. And I think that is so interesting because that is essentially our status as Christians, right? We are not of this world. We are members and citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that is coming. Yet in the here and now, we find ourselves living in this world. We are in it, but we are not of it. Living in this culture that largely does not honor God and in many ways goes against what he has commanded of us. And so the first question I want to ask just from this beginning part of Daniel's story is as Christians, are we influencing our culture for Christ or are we allowing it to influence us? And Daniel was the perfect example of this. So rather than being influenced by Babylonian culture and beginning to look like it, he was able to retain his distinct identity as an Israelite. And because of this, he was able to influence change in Babylon rather than having it change him. And so because Daniel refused to conform to the culture around him, God was able to use him in these incredible ways. Just a couple quick examples of that. Daniel was able to interpret these dreams that the king of Babylon had and the interpretation of these dreams revealed to the Babylonians truths about the kingdom of God. Again, read through the story if you want all the details on that, but it is incredible. And then God also promotes Daniel to be the ruler over a whole province within Babylon. And that is just the beginning of what God does through Daniel because he does not conform to the culture, but rather maintains his identity as an Israelite. And so I want to unpack that story a little bit. Quick side note, I always get questions about my Bible. I'm going to be reading from this. I always have my Bible and then all of my Bible study tools linked below if you want to check this out. And so I want to ask the question, how did Daniel influence rather than being influenced? And as we're asking this question, we're also going to be asking ourselves this question of how can we be influencers in a biblical sense? And so I want to share three points that we get here from the story of Daniel. The first point is this, Daniel knew his points of non-participation and he held them. So when Daniel was first brought to Babylon with these three other young men, again, Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego, I just think those are the most fun names to say, the king essentially again wanted to disciple them in a way, right? He wanted to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. I'm just looking down here from chapter one. And he wanted to feed them with the food and wine that he himself as the king ate and drank. So he wanted to give them the king's food and drink, educate them in the literature and language, and essentially educate them over this period of three years. And so Daniel, though, didn't agree to all of this. He had some points where he was not going to participate. And it's interesting because Daniel didn't refuse everything, right? He didn't say no to all of these things that the king wanted to do, but he did refuse some things. So the first thing that he refused is the food. We see that here in chapter one the king wanted to give him all of his elaborate food and wine and drink. And Daniel says here in verse 12, test your servants for 10 days. Let us just be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. So he did not want to eat the king's food. It says in chapter eight, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And so he said, just give us veggies and water instead. And then later on in the story, his friends, Radshak, Meshach, Abednego, they refused to bow down down to King Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. So if you watched Veggie Tales, you would have remembered this as the chocolate bunny that they refused to bow down to. And at this point in the story, God has already brought Daniel to a position of leadership. So he's not put in the same position as his three friends of having to choose whether or not to bow down. But we see from his friends that they refused to worship this false God. And so they had their points where they were not going to participate, where they were going to refuse to assimilate. And so Daniel knew these points where he drew a hard and fast line where he was not going to participate in the Babylonian culture. And so obviously he didn't completely remove himself from the culture. He couldn't, right? Because he was living there and he was here in the king's sort of service or inner circle. So he didn't remove himself completely. And in some ways he even entered into the culture to influence change. Yet he knew where the line was. He knew where that line of assimilation was and he refused to cross it. He held it 
firmly. And I think this is important to note because I think a lot of times we sort of hear that rhetoric in Christian culture, right? That we have to become a part of the culture. We got to adapt to it because if we don't, then we're not going to influence it. And that is true to a point that there is a way that we need to enter in and influence change from within. But we also need to remember that we cannot influence a culture if we look exactly like it. There was a sermon series done at a church near me, not the church that I go to, but a church in San Francisco a couple of years back on the book of Daniel that I just thought was so powerful. I'll try to find it and link it below. But the pastor of that church, it was Reality San Francisco, Pastor Dave Lomas said this quote that I still remember. He said, we cannot redemptively participate in our culture until we know the points where we must draw the line in non-participation. And so he's basically saying, yes, we want to participate in the culture with the goal of redeeming it, of influencing it for good, but we cannot do that. We cannot participate in it in a healthy or redemptive way unless we know those lines that we are not going to cross. And so I want to talk about this idea of what are those lines. And the reality is, is that we are not going to know where those lines are unless we are renewing our minds. In Romans 1 21, Paul says, for although they knew him as God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And because of this, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And Paul says something very similar to this in Ephesians 4. I did a little standalone Bible study on that chapter as well. But this passage is literally saying that there are these people who know God. This isn't even talking about people who don't know him or don't believe in him. It's saying that there are these people who know God, but because they are not actively acknowledging him as God and honoring him as God and giving thanks to him, that because of that, their thinking has become futile and their hearts have become darkened. And so literally according to this verse, Paul is saying that if we are not actively honoring God, acknowledging him as God, giving thanks to him and putting him in the appropriate place in our lives, then we can't even trust our way of thinking of what we might think is right or wrong or okay or not okay. We can't even even trust our own judgment or thinking because this verse is saying that without doing those things and orienting ourselves toward God and who he is and what he has revealed in his word, then without that, our thinking is going to become futile and our mind is darkened. And so according to this passage, if we are not regularly in scripture, renewing our minds, we can't even really trust what we think to be right or wrong, what we think is okay to participate in and to not participate in. And so the first thing is that we need to be renewing our minds. I know I talk about that in all of my videos because it is just so crucial, but also according to this verse, that's also why we have those times when we look at people who are maybe outside of the church or maybe even sometimes people within the church and we think you know how can they think that is okay or how can they think there can be any question on this issue that is clearly spelled out in scripture and clearly shown as either right or wrong and the answer is that unless we are renewing our minds in scripture then scripture itself tells us that our minds are not going to go according to the way of God we're going to become futile in our thinking and we're not going to be able to trust it and so apart from God we cannot have a correct sense of morality God is the one who defines morality and so in order to understand it we first have to seek him know him in his word and he does define it here there is a black and white and yes there are some areas where there might be gray areas of things that are not clearly addressed in the bible but there are also plenty of things that are clearly defined clearly black or white. Isaiah says in chapter 5 verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And in many ways our culture has done this, right? We praise things that break God's heart. We have them as our entertainment. We say that things that are truly against what God has commanded for us, we celebrate them as good. We call evil good and good evil. And so the Bible speaks directly to this. And so as people of God, if we want to actually influence the culture around us, rather than being influenced by it, we cannot be afraid to not only stand for the truth, but also to speak the truth. And this isn't always going to be popular. I was just talking to some friends this past week, just talking about current events and different things in the world. And we were talking about the conversations that's brought in our lives. And my friends just shared some stuff with me over text that I found really encouraging. I'm literally going to read their text to you because I just found it so encouraging and also think that it's so important. My friend Evan said, as Christians, we must always speak the truth in love, but we must also understand
understand that God's truth and God's love is different than the world's, and it may not always sound loving or even truthful to them. But if what we believe is true, then people don't need a watered down version of the truth, but they do need grace and truth. And so that's what Evan said, and then his wife Tess also said something she said, I take comfort in the fact that the gospel we believe and share is one that is so disliked and persecuted. In today's world, that shows me that we are believing and sharing the correct one. Jesus said the world would hate us for it, and those that are preaching the same beliefs as the world, but claiming it in the name of Jesus is not where we want to be. And so if we want to influence the culture around us, we need to be willing to stand for the truth, to speak the truth, to do it in love, but to recognize that even when we do it in love, it is not always going to be popular to the world around us, and they are not always going to want to hear it. Because our sinful hearts are naturally opposed to the truth, at enmity with the truth, and we need God to transform form our hearts. The gospel is that we were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive together with Christ. Jesus imparts his perfect righteousness on us when we put our faith in him, but that is precisely why it is so crucial that we not minimize the gravity of sin, because when we do, it cheapens the very grace he died to give us. And so we are to speak the truth in love, but we are never to throw out truth in the name of love, because when we do, we fail to truly love at all. So Daniel knew his points of non-participation and he held them. And as we'll see from Daniel's story, sometimes standing for the truth can be messy. It can cause issues. In our case, maybe it means that it might make people dislike you or in some parts of the world, it can even lead to persecution, but God uses it and he used it in Daniel's story. So in these areas where Daniel refused to participate, these refusals actually showed the Babylonian people God's power. So when he refused to eat the king's food and he had the veggies instead, he basically said, test us and see if we are not just as strong after 10 days as the men who you have been feeding this elaborate food. And it says in verse 15 of chapter one, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. And then later on in the story, when Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the chocolate bunny or the golden image, if we want to be, you know, biblically accurate, they were thrown into this fiery furnace, but if you know the story, they were spared from the fire and not a single hair on their head was singed. They were protected from that miraculously, and this led to King Nebuchadnezzar issuing a decree that no one could speak out against the God of Israel because he saw the power of the God of Israel. And this also led to King Nebuchadnezzar himself praising God. It talks about that in chapter four. It's an entire subheading that says Nebuchadnezzar praises God because he saw his power. So these refusals that Daniel and his friends held, those lines they held in the sand, that actually revealed to the Babylonians who God was. And so one final note on how to know what things that we are supposed to refuse to participate in, how to know where we need to draw lines in the culture. I want to point out the theme of the two things that Daniel refused. So what did he refuse? One, he refused something that he consumed, and two, he refused what he worshiped. And so as you are thinking through, man, are there some areas where I am starting to look more like the culture or the world around me than I am influencing it to look like Christ? Ask yourself the questions, what do I consume? What am I filling my mind and my heart with? And two, what do I worship? Because those were the two areas of non-participation for Daniel. So in refusing to do these things, Daniel was setting himself apart so that instead of starting to look like Babylon, he could give Babylon a picture of the God of Israel. As we're thinking through how to engage culture, and again, what things should we be consuming or not, or what should we participate in or not, I want to share a really helpful resource with you, particularly if you maybe work in youth ministry like I do, and you are around teenagers a lot of the time, or if you are a parent of a teenager, and so I'm going to share that at the end of the video. This isn't a sponsorship or anything, but this is a really unique organization I came across that I think is doing really important work in this area. And so I just want to take a minute to talk about that at the end. But for now, let's go to point number two of how did Daniel influence the culture rather than being influenced by it. And the second point is this, he prayed for the people that God was using him to influence. So like we talked about in the first point, so much of influence is boldly living your life in a way that other people can see as an example and learn from. But we have to 
remember that we are never doing this of our own power. So later on in Daniel's story in chapter 9, it talks about how Daniel earnestly prays for the people who he is influencing, these Babylonian people, and he fasts with sackcloth and ashes. And so he had this heart that earnestly cared to see change. He cared for these people who he was influencing. I think that especially in our current climate, it's easy to get into arguments or have this combative spirit or to see somebody post something on Facebook and think, how can they believe that? Or how can they think that way or think that that is okay? And I've totally found myself getting caught up in this as well. Just feeling like there is so much deception in this world and so many people being led astray. But sometimes it's easy to forget that the most simple yet powerful thing that we can do for people is to pray for them with compassion because God alone changes hearts. We don't have that power. One thing I started doing toward the beginning of quarantine that I sort of got out of the habit of but really want to get back into is just doing prayer walks. So basically just taking a little walk around the neighborhood as a little break from work and taking that time to pray. Prayer is powerful. It's often the first thing we forget to do, but it needs to be the first thing we remember to do because prayer changes things. So the third and final point of how did Daniel influence rather than being influenced is this. He remembered the purpose for which he was influencing. So if you wanted to become an influencer in the typical sense of being like a digital influencer or whatever, the first thing you would need to ask yourself is what do I want to influence people toward? Do I wanna be a fashion blogger? Do I wanna be a food blogger, a faith blogger? Like what am I trying to influence people toward? And Daniel knew the answer to this question. He knew what he was influencing people toward. He knew where his face was set. So later on in the story, when Daniel is about to get thrown into the lion's den. This basically happens because these officials within sort of the king's chamber or reign or whatever, these people were trying to find some reason to basically take Daniel out, but they couldn't find any reason. And so they realized, you know, we need to come up with this verdict where we ban people from making any sort of petition to God. So basically banning prayer and Daniel's like, well, that's not going to happen. So I guess throw me in the lion's den. And so leading up to this, he began to fervently pray. And I want to read what it says. It says, says in verse 10 of chapter 6, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed of this order being given out, he went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. I just think this is so cool because it says specifically that he had his windows opened toward Jerusalem. Well, what is Jerusalem? Jerusalem was the true kingdom to which Daniel belonged. Even though he was living in Babylon, Jerusalem was the place that he had come from and it was the promised place to which his people would return. And so what was necessary for Daniel to resist assimilation into Babylonian culture and to maintain his distinct identity as one of God's people was a continual reorienting of his heart and his mind toward the kingdom that was coming, the kingdom to which he truly belonged. And the same is true for you and me. It is so easy to get fixated on everything of this world, but everything of this world is temporary. Everything of this world is fleeting. We need to fix our eyes on the kingdom that is coming every day. It says three times a day he prayed as he was facing toward Jerusalem. We need to continually be reorienting our mind to the kingdom that is coming, the kingdom that we truly belong to. And we need to remember that the goal of our influence is to usher people into that kingdom. The goal of our influence is never to try to get people to like us or to look like us. The goal of our influence is to get them to look like Christ. And in order for that to happen, our sights need to be fixated on Christ. We need to be spending time with him. Sights set on Jesus, the author and perfect factor of our faith. I want to read this quote. I shared it on my Instagram stories a little bit. I honestly don't even know who this guy is, but I came across this quote on Twitter and I was like, that's good. So it says, the influence God gives you is not given for the sake of preserving your influence. Influence is given by God so that you can boldly and unabashedly strive to advance Christ's kingdom, not your own. Your kingdom is fleeting. Christ's kingdom is eternal. And that's by a guy 
called Grant R. Castleberry. Thanks, Grant. And so as Christ followers, the only image that we are to be conformed to is the image of Christ. So I mentioned before a resource that's really helpful, particularly if you work with teenagers or youth, or if you have, if you're a parent with kids in that age range. And the resource I want to tell you about is an organization called Axis. Again, this isn't sponsored, but they reached out to me and I just thought that what they did is so cool and honestly so needed, especially from working with the high schoolers at my church. I think that what they do is incredible. Their mission statement, it says this, connecting parents, teens, and Jesus in a disconnected world. And so essentially what Axis does is they create all of these resources that help parents engage in conversations about things that are relevant in culture, specifically for their kids. And so I can just tell you from firsthand experience working with the high school girls at my church that sometimes they even use lingo that I'm like, what does that mean? Like we stand or lit or period or whatever. There's so many of them. And I know what most of them mean now, but legitimately there's sometimes I have to ask my girls to tell me what does that mean? So there's this lingo, but there's just also all of these things that they're immersed in that sometimes parents can be really disconnected from or youth leaders or youth pastors can be really disconnected from. And so Axis creates these guides that basically help address some of these cultural issues from a biblical perspective to aid parents or aid youth workers or aid youth pastors in having those conversations. And so an example would be they did an entire guide on Billie Eilish. I personally don't listen to her music, but I know that it's really popular, especially among the younger generation. And it basically goes through and shares, here's what some of her music talks about. Here's some of the things that she says or how she presents herself so that maybe a parent who knows nothing about Billie Eilish, but knows that their daughter loves listening to her can have a little bit more information about who she is, what she stands for, so that they know how to approach some of those conversations. That is just one example, but they do all sorts of different ones. They do it on cancel culture, anxiety, depression. Um, I'm just gonna read through some of these things. K-pop, purity, modesty, a college prep guide, a sex talk. They literally have a guide on everything and it's all meant to provide biblically grounded resources to help parents just sort of bridge that gap with their kids. And so I think this is something that could be really helpful for parents or um, honestly youth groups to be able to equip and give leaders and parents these types of resources. And so again, I am not getting paid to talk about this. I just think it's a really cool resource. I do have a link down below that is an affiliate link. And so I will get a small commission if you purchase through that link. But again, just really wanted to share about it because I think that it's a needed resource. But anyways, to briefly recap this video, how can we be influencers rather than being influenced? One, know your points of non-participation and hold them. Study God's word. Know Know what it has to say and let God guide your convictions by the Holy Spirit. Two, pray for the people God is using you to influence and pray for your own heart that you are driven by compassion, not condemnation. Three, remember the purpose you are influencing for. Set your sights on the kingdom that is to come because all the little kingdoms we try to build in the here and the now are fleeting. I hope so much that you found this video to be encouraging and helpful. Leave a comment down below letting me know one thing that you took away from this video that you want to remember. And then also don't forget to check out Axis if you felt like that is something that would be helpful to you. But thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in my next one. Bye.